Of all the video game genres, few are as taxing or rewarding as stealth games. Whether they involve sneaking past security cameras in a future dystopia, or hiding from bloodthirsty guards in the ancient past, stealth games are often slow and stressful affairs, lacking the pizzazz or immediate gratification that so many other experiences offer. But when everything comes together, and one squeezes through their quiet gauntlets without leaving a trace, the sense of satisfaction that they provide is unlike anything else. For a generation of gamers, few other experiences epitomize this better than Looking Glass Studios' Thief The Dark Project, where competing stealth titles like Metal Gear Solid allowed players to go full Rambo at the drop of a hat. The Dark Project forced its audience to keep to the shadows and use every affordance its mechanics and environments provided in order to avoid being caught. It was among its genre's most formative experiences, and it was followed shortly after its release by a sequel that all but improved its greatest qualities, establishing both as being among the greatest gaming duologies of their era. Unfortunately, no sooner had the series made itself known than Looking Glass was forced to close its doors, and its ownership was passed on to Ion Storm's Austin branch. The latter would do its best amid trying circumstances to do Thief justice and deliver a game that, while not perfect, would have plenty of strong points. But like a curse from on high, this third entry would neither save Ion Storm from its own subsequent demise, nor prevent the series from resting afterwards in peace. Were this all that there was to Thief's history, one wouldn't be remiss calling it tragic. Yet in between all of its mainline titles, the series saw no shortage of support from its fans, who did their best to keep its memory alive with pro bono projects of stunning ambition. And when these fans were also AAA developers, the games that they produced rarely failed to do the same. This is the rise and fall of Thief. During the last decade of the 20th century, few video game developers inspired as much reverence as the Massachusetts-based Looking Glass Studios. Founded in 1990 by a small yet passionate group of designers, Looking Glass's first five years were spent winning over PC gamers' hearts with a catalog that was as acclaimed as it was varied. Its first game, Ultima Underworld – The Stygian Abyss, wowed role-playing fans in 1992 with its deep mechanics and immersive, labyrinthine world, which featured expansive 3D environments at a time when most other video games were a dimension behind. Then, after releasing a well-received sequel and a John Madden football game, it threw cyberpunk aficionados for a loop in 1994 with System Shock, a subversive action game that saw players attempt to liberate a space station from the grips of a malevolent AI. And the year after that, it proved it could take to the skies with Flight Unlimited, an aerobatic flight simulator that garnered the approval of countless would-be pilots. No matter the genre or setting, Looking Glass seemed to have the Midas touch when it came to game development, transforming every project it worked on into digital gold. However, after the release of Terra Nova Strike Force Centauri in 1996, many within the studio were left wondering how much longer they'd be able to keep on this track. A tactical first-person shooter set within the 24th century, Terra Nova was well received, but left its developers knee-deep in debt, throwing its plans for the future into uncertainty. In the end, Looking Glass was quick to find creditors willing to help it remain afloat and stave off what could have very well been an untimely death at Terra Nova's hands. Yet it was even quicker to cancel plans to develop a sequel, believing that the talent of its employees would be better served elsewhere. It was around this time that a few of these employees attempted to pitch Better Red Than Undead, a first-person sword-fighting game that would have thrust players into a Cold War-era zombie apocalypse. According to those that helped conceive it, Better Red would have been both silly yet complex, and allowed players to ally themselves with a host of opposing factions to keep the zombies at bay, turning their fight against the ghoulish army into a war of both diplomacy and dismemberment. While the powers that were shut it down relatively quickly, 
a window was kept open for a reinvention. In a 2013 retrospective on Rock Paper Shotgun, Looking Glass's Mark LeBlanc would explain how the studio's executives found its emphasis on sword fighting to be fine, yet its premise too quirky and contrived for its own good. They wanted players to be thrust into a fictional universe where wielding blades would make more intrinsic sense, as well as be easier to market to the masses. Complying with this sentiment, the team went back to the drawing board and conceived Dark Camelot, a twisted sword fighting game inspired by Arthurian myth. Within Dark Camelot's world, King Arthur was to be a tyrant that ruled with an iron fist, and invented the legend of the Holy Grail as a means of controlling his vassals. Merlin would have been a psychotic marketer that traveled back in time from the future. The Knights of the Round Table would have been thugs that wore jerseys covered in corporate logos. And Mordred, Arthur's bastard son slash nephew, would have been on a one-man quest to end all of their lives. Unlike Better Red, Dark Camelot managed to quickly gain momentum, with Looking Glass's staff assembling a smattering of tech demos and artwork after its basic premise was ironed out. Many within the team were hopeful that they would be able to get it out the door in less than a year and use the revenue it would generate to launch a burgeoning franchise. Yet no sooner had they begun to hope this than Dark Camelot started to fall apart. Its gameplay morphed and grew well beyond its original scope. Its staff kept getting shuffled around to other projects and those that weren't shuffled realized that they hadn't the slightest clue how they were going to market it. However, while all of this was going on, the team continued to draft up levels to eventually include in Dark Camelot, and noticed that time and time again, the levels that they were giving the best definition and detail to all involved covertly breaking into Arthur's court. They were completely at odds with the rest of the project's focus, yet they were also some of the easiest to explain to other people, and tantalizingly novel. Sensing an opportunity to turn the game's troubled fortunes around, Looking Glass founder Paul Neurath suggested that they drop the game's Arthurian setting, and instead focus on creating a game centered on a thief. The team obliged, and the project was utterly overhauled. Arthur's kingdom morphed into a steampunk-inspired sprawl. Its knightly villains gave way to opposing religious orders called the Hammerites and the Pagans. And Mordred was replaced with Garrett, a master thief trained by the secretive Keeper organization. What was previously Dark Camelot became Thief the Dark Project. Garrett, it's Victorian. I trust you made it back alive. You've done well, Garrett. Come with me and bring the sword. There is someone you have to meet. It's time for the payment you've been promised. In the months that followed, Looking Glass's staff experienced both triumphs and struggles as they worked to bring Thief to fruition. Even though there were few other stealth titles at the time that they could look to for guidance, the team had little trouble coming up with ways to make their game into a stealth lover's wonderland, conceiving offbeat mechanics like water arrows, which could be used to remotely douse torches in order to encourage covert play. They also managed to assemble all of the code and assets needed to create these scenarios with much greater ease than normal, as a result of having access to an especially efficient suite of development tools. This included Thief's Engine, the Dark Engine, which Looking Glass's staff specifically designed so that it would enable its programmers, artists, and designers to work more effectively and independently than ever before, as well as yield impressive 3D graphics and physics effects. And, like with most of Looking Glass's prior endeavors, there was no shortage of individuals on the team willing to give it their all to see it finished. One such individual was Randy Smith, a programmer by trade but a designer by heart. Smith joined Thieves production only partway through, but went on to play a pivotal role in shaping it, helping craft the layout of many of its levels as well as other, more minute aspects of its design. And yet, despite all of this, the team also spent a significant amount of time dealing with issues the likes of which they'd never encountered before. Perhaps most notoriously, they experienced severe trouble getting the game's enemy AI to function as intended, with Garrett's adversaries acting unpredictably and unfairly throughout much of the project's development. Knock your teeth out! Ah! While they eventually managed to fix this problem, doing so cost its programmers many sleepless nights and resulted in Thief's core gameplay only coming together in the latter stages of its development. Setbacks such as these, and all of the other frustrations that cropped up over the course of Thief's development 
were made all the more challenging after Looking Glass released British Open Championship Golf in 1997. Like Terra Nova before it, Championship Golf proved a critical success, but a massive commercial bomb. So massive that the studio was forced to lay off a sizable number of its staff and close down a subsidiary it had established in Austin to remain afloat. In addition to causing those that remained on staff severe heartbreak, these layoffs tripped up what little momentum Thief had managed to build up until this point, and it would take some time for both to fully recover. Despite all this, the final few months of the game's development wound up being among the most productive and spirited that Looking Glass's staff ever experienced. And when it finally released in December of 1998, players around the globe would vindicate this effort and find Thief the Dark Project to be a triumph in nearly all aspects of its design, as well as one of the studio's best titles. Its graphics and sound design did an excellent job of immersing them in its eerie setting. Its story kept them moving through its walls with bated breath, and its gameplay ensured that they never got tired of doing so. Acting stealthily and keeping out of sight in each of the game's levels simply felt oh so rewarding, and the wide array of mechanics and systems that could be taken advantage of all the while meant that there was never just one right way to get through them. It did a fantastic job of not only making players feel like the Master Thief, but leaving them with plenty of room to define exactly what kind of Master Thief they wanted to be. The only major area where players would take umbrage with Thief would be its small assortment of non-stealth-oriented levels. Appearing just frequently enough throughout the game to draw most players' ire, these levels usually involved Garrett fighting supernatural monsters like zombies and giant spiders, and drew many unfavorable comparisons to Tomb Raider. In interviews following the game's release, many within Looking Glass would themselves express mixed feelings on these parts of the game explaining how they only decided to include them after concerns grew that players might not take to Thief's quieter levels. It struck them as better to hedge their bets and include thrills that people already understood and enjoyed, instead of just focusing on a single, unproven style of play. At the end of the day, however, this issue would do little to dissuade gamers from buying Thief in droves, and using both it and the original Metal Gear Solid as landmark examples of just how much the stealth genre had to offer. Thief. System Shock, and Ultima Underworld would also be heralded in later years as progenitive examples of the immersive sim, a term that would be coined by ex-Looking Glass employees to refer to action games that allow players to interact with their architecture and systems with a high degree of freedom, and as a result of this, support varied and creative solutions to the problems they impose. The following year, Looking Glass would release Thief Gold, an expanded edition of the stealth title that featured a host of mechanical improvements, a smattering of bug fixes, and three new levels, two of which the studio had previously intended to include in the game's original release but had been omitted due to time constraints. The edition would be well received by fans of the original game, who found these changes made for a stronger, more complete experience, and would go on to be heralded as the optimal way to experience the series' first outing. In the end, however, while Thief's burgeoning community would spend many hours stealthing through Gold's enhanced levels, they would spend countless more pursuing its mission editor, Dromid. Released by Looking Glass both as a standalone download and on disc with Gold, Dromid quickly became the toolkit of choice for a generation of aspiring level designers, who would use it to produce a tremendous amount of custom-made content over the next few years. This content, in turn, would go on to become a cornerstone of the franchise's identity and result in subsequent versions of the series' editors being made available to the public well into the future. The same year would also see Looking Glass complete development on System Shock 2 alongside Irrational Games. The latter studio had been founded two years prior by several former Looking Glass staff, including one Ken Levine, who had helped lay down much of the groundwork for Thief's narrative and characters during the early stages of its production. The sci-fi sequel represented the first project undertaken by the fledgling studio since its inception, yet its quality would prove second to none. With its twist-riddled story, moody atmosphere, and deep level of customizability, earning both studios countless accolades upon its release. Unfortunately, while System Shock 2 also wouldn't sell that badly, it would fail all the same to cushion Looking Glass from the subsequent financial failure of Flight Unlimited 3, which would release to abysmal sales just a little over a month after the sci-fi title's arrival. After managing to climb its way out of the red with Thief's help, 
The onus was once again on the studio to work its magic and bring itself back from the brink with a game that would sell as well as it played. It was a precarious situation, but Looking Glass had reason to remain hopeful because all the while this had been happening, its staff had been hard at work on Thief 2 The Metal Age. The moment that production began on Thief 2, Looking Glass's staff had made the almost unanimous decision to have the sequel focus more on stealthy gameplay and less on action or supernatural monsters. With fans and critics alike having sounded off their displeasure at these elements after the first game's release, there was no reason to include them anymore. Instead of being a grab bag of different gameplay styles, the sequel would be a tighter, more focused exploration of being a master thief. In order to make this prospect just as fresh and exciting as it had been the first time around, the team decided to inject its world with a splash of modernity. A new technocratic faction known as the Mechanists were introduced into the Metal Ages narrative, and with them, a host of technological advances and constructs designed to make players' lives harder, such as steam-driven robots and security cameras. The artificial intelligence of the game's enemies were likewise improved so that they would respond to threats with greater realism, and Garrett was equipped with new tools that would allow him to counter this realism with greater finesse, such as a remote camera that could be used to spy on enemies from a distance. Plans were also put into motion to integrate a multiplayer component into the sequel, with Looking Glass's staff prototyping a host of competitive and cooperative game modes that made heavy use of Thief's stealth mechanics. But after falling behind schedule, the team decided that it would be better if they instead siphoned this component into its own separate release and focused on getting the Metal Age's main course out the door. In a retrospective posted on Salon shortly after the game's release, many of Looking Glass's staff would describe how the project's publisher, Eidos Interactive, effectively pressured them to complete the sequel post-haste during its final few months, which in turn resulted in an intense period of crunch. Office floors became beds, programmers coded through the night, and opportunities were missed from the perspective of at least a few designers to make an even more polished experience. These designers may have very well been right. Yet when Thief 2 The Metal Age arrived on store shelves in March of 2000, most stealth fans were hard pressed as to how it could have been made much better. Pretty much every facet of the sequel, from the layout of its levels to the feel of the game's mechanics, felt tremendously improved over those of its predecessor and provided for an even richer stealth experience than before one that both demanded smarter play, but still allowed for a great deal of self-expression. Almost everyone that played it was in agreement. If the Dark Project had represented its series' birth, then the Metal Age represented its maturity. Nevertheless, some came away from the sequel miffed by the lack of wonderment to its environments, finding Looking Glass's decision to have the sequel feature much fewer supernatural elements and monsters took away from the surreal, offbeat mood established by its predecessor. In a 2011 podcast appearance, Randy Smith would express feelings similarly, explaining that while he was still immensely proud of what he and the rest of Looking Glass accomplished with Thief 2, he felt that in the end, they may have focused too much on just stealth and human enemies for its own good, that they overcorrected the first game's flaws, where they should have tried to achieve more of a balance. A fair few would also find the Metal Age's graphics to be a little dated, though even its harshest critics would admit that this rarely detracted from the rest of the experience. You gone! You gone too far this time, you camel man a tunic wearing mollycoddle! An arrow in the throat and I'll shut you up! Uh, have that day! The next two months at Looking Glass were spent working on Thief 2's Gold Edition, as well as projects like Jane's Attack Squadron, a combat flight simulator. It seemed like business as usual for the studio, but internally, many were beginning to sweat. While they were on track to ship Attack Squadron soon, both the costliness of its development and a deal gone wrong to work on an espionage game titled Deep Cover had left the studio even more in debt than it had been after incurring Flight and Limited 3's losses, and it wasn't due to receive royalty payments on Thief 2 for a while longer. Few believed that their end was truly upon them, but there was no doubt in their minds that desperate measures needed to be taken. As a result, Looking Glass began shopping itself around to companies willing to buy it, and soon found itself deep in negotiations with the publisher of the first two Thief games, Eidos Interactive. 
Eidos had already agreed to continue serving as the Stealth series publisher for several more titles to come, and held no reservations about purchasing the studio that made them as well. But then, just as the deal was about to go through, the publisher backed out due to financial troubles of its own and the negotiations were cancelled. Sensing that its options had run dry, Looking Glass finally gave up the ghost and closed its doors. While most within the studio were left saddened by this turn of events, most also took the occasion as an opportunity to break out their champagne and celebrate. Amidst the heartbreak of knowing that their days making games together were over, there was also considerable joy knowing that the games they'd made had utterly changed the industry for the better. And this joy would persist until Looking Glass's lights went dark for the last time. Nonetheless, a bit of additional sadness would follow in the weeks after the studio's closure, when it would quietly be revealed that Looking Glass had also been preparing to work on Thief 3 before biting the dust, and that its staff had possessed incredibly ambitious plans for it. In a forum post on a Looking Glass fan site written during this time, Smith would claim that this included an open-ended version of the franchise's nameless city that would have allowed Garrett to steal at his leisure, and a crazy plot that would heavily involve the Keepers. Many fans were left dismayed. It was already sad enough that Thief 2's Gold Edition and Multiplayer Suite were now no longer coming, but learning that Looking Glass had been planning on taking the series to greater heights after their releases made the situation all the more unfortunate. Little did anyone know that in less than a year, Thief 3 would be rebooted, and with the help of many of its former developers. Through the universe trying to figure out this big mystery what's going on and how can they stop what's going on that's it that's about it dude cool right. four years before looking glasses closure id software veterans john romero and tom hall had decided to strike out on their own and form a development studio in dallas called ion storm the company's founders wanted ion storm to be unlike any other studio before it a place where the best and brightest would develop multiple genres of games simultaneously and be able to focus more on the art of design than most other companies typically allowed for. It was an incredibly ambitious plan, and it became even more so the following year, when Ion Storm's founders established a second office in Austin with the help of veteran game designer Warren Spector. Spector had previously aided in the development of both Ultima Underworlds and the first System Shock while working as a producer at Origin Systems, before helping set up and manage Looking Glass's own Austin-based subsidiary prior to its closure in 1997. Following this, the designer decided that it was high time he developed his dream game, a first-person action title inspired by Hollywood blockbusters. And after a chance conversation with Romero, he was convinced to do so as part of Ion Storm. Unfortunately, once both of Ion Storm's halves got going, things quickly fell into turmoil. While its Austin office succeeded in cultivating Spectre's dream title into a cyberpunk action game named Deus Ex and releasing it in 2000 to critical and commercial acclaim, its Dallas office became embroiled in controversy and mismanagement. Deadlines were missed, power struggles ran rampant, and its first major game of consequence, a time-traveling first-person shooter called Daikatana, ended up being a massive flop. Many became upset at the studio's prime office, including Eidos Interactive, which had agreed in years prior to provide the company with much needed advances in exchange for a controlling stake in their operations. And while it would manage to earn back a smattering of goodwill in 2001, when it released an intergalactic role-playing game called Anachronox, these failures and frustrations would ultimately lead to it being shut down a short while after, leaving its Austin office the only remaining branch of Ion Storm. Hey! It was during this tumultuous time that Spectre learned that Eidos had managed to scoop up Thief's property rights and had designs to see Thief 3 through to fruition. By this point, work was already beginning with an eye on Storm Austin on Deus Ex's sequel, Invisible War, but the veteran game designer didn't want Thief to end up in another, less qualified studio's hands. As a result, Spectre requested that Ion Storm Austin oversee its development as well, and began hiring as many former Looking Glass staff as he could to aid the studio in doing so, including Randy Smith, whom he promptly placed in front of the project as its director. From there, the hodgepodge of former Looking Glass and Ion Storm employees began planning out how they were going to invest players once more in Garrett's adventures. 
Everyone agreed that it was in their best interest to go back to their original plans for Thief 3 from before Looking Glass's closure, which entailed a riveting narrative that would see Garrett explore an open-ended interpretation of the franchise's city and fight a corrupt rendition of the organization that trained him. But a new generation of Thief called for even more new improvements and changes to its core formula. Changes such as allowing players to switch between a first-person and third-person viewpoint, which the team decided to implement after a couple of members hacked together a well-received prototype of the game running entirely in this manner. Together, the hope was that all of these ideas would elevate their game above and beyond its predecessors and reach the largest audience the series had ever known. They were no longer developing Thief 3. They were developing Thief Deadly Shadows. Unfortunately, once development on Deadly Shadows began in full swing, the team slowly started to realize that they had a bit of a technology problem. Unlike the first two Thief titles which had been developed from the ground up for the PC, Ion Storm had made the decision to develop theirs for both the PC and the Xbox, the latter of which being a platform that few had much experience with and was far less powerful than the former. This alone was a fairly significant issue, and it was compounded further when Ion Storm decided that the project would also feature a custom renderer that would be able to project real-time shadows from every character and object. Slowly but surely, the team found themselves bowing before the demands of both home console and renderer, and reworking increasingly large portions of the game for the worse. Its open-ended city was cut down to a fraction of what was originally planned. Its levels were divided into smaller chunks interspersed by loading screens, and the overall mood within the company became increasingly downtrodden and difficult, so much so that Randy Smith would end up leaving the project shortly before its completion. Surprisingly, however, Ion Storm Austin managed to release Deadly Shadows in May of 2004 to a largely positive reception. Players would take issue with the most apparent concessions that Ion Storm had been forced to make to its world and gameplay, with the game's abundance of loading screens proving a large sore spot. Yet they would also be thoroughly impressed with the quality of the game's enemy AI, the sense of immersion provided by its environments, and overall design of its levels, finding each to have only improved since the Metal Age. And almost everyone agreed that no other part of the game illustrated this improvement better than the penultimate level of Deadly Shadows, Robbing the Cradle. Set within a decrepit insane asylum, Robbing the Cradle featured strong survival horror elements in addition to thievery and stealth, with each turn through its haunted halls yielding all manner of frights both real and imagined. It was utterly unlike anything else before it, but in the best way possible. To diehard fans of Looking Glass's duology, it was lacking the slickness of its predecessors, and to Ion Storm staff, it was a mere shadow of what they originally hoped to make. But in the end, Deadly Shadows managed to rise above all of the frustrations that surrounded its release, and carve out a place for itself in the hearts of many players. Ion Storm would spend the rest of 2004 conceptualizing new Deus Ex and Thief games with Harvey Smith, one of the studio's chief creatives, briefly working on the latter. Like Warren Spector, Harvey had fluttered between Origin Systems and Looking Glass Studios during his early years, before finding his calling in Austin as the lead designer of the first two Deus Ex games. And when he got a hold of Thief's Mantle, he and everyone else involved took more than a few cues from the former series. As detailed in a 2015 report by Eurogamer, this new entry, titled Thief 4 Dagger of Ways, would have seen Garrett transplanted into a modern-day setting, a darkly colorful metropolis of shadow, neon, and moonlight that would resemble an amalgamation of America's most iconic cities. Within its confines, Garrett would have been able to use new, contemporary technologies like night vision goggles, as well as interact with his surroundings on a deeper level than ever before. But he also would have been able to use the eponymous Dagger of Ways to enter the Wraith world, a parallel dimension inhabited by dangerous, shadowy monstrosities. Shifting into the Wraith world would allow him to bypass difficult stealth segments in the real world, but put him in danger of the former reality's fiends, and the tension of deciding whether this was a risk worth taking would, in theory, permeate the entire experience. Upon being presented with this pitch, however, Eidos disapproved of its supernatural elements and asked that Ion Storm remove them. Not wanting to give up on the property, the team complied, and reworked the reboot to be almost entirely grounded in reality only for it to be cancelled a few months later, after Harvey left to join French developer Arcane Studios. 
Following this, Ion Storm Austin would bleed employees on a continuous basis, before ultimately being closed down by Eidos in February of 2005. While its closure left many saddened, few of its remaining members were taken aback when it finally happened. Unlike Looking Glass before it, almost everyone within Ion Storm had expected that their end was fast approaching during their last few months and had been prepared for the worst. This way! Beware an intruder! Over the course of the next five years, the Thief series would continue, more than ever, to be kept alive by its community, with fan-led projects providing the franchise faithful with plenty of content to chew on while Eidos remained quiet on its future. One especially impressive project that was made available during this period was a 2005 expansion mod for Thief 2 titled Thief 2X – Shadows of the Metal Age. The brainchild of a passionate group of fans called the Dark Engineering Guild, Shadows of the Metal Age had originally been conceived by the Guild in 2000 as a means of continuing the stealth series following Looking Glass's closure. Over the course of its development, however, the project gradually took on a life of its own, morphing into a side story set concurrently to Garrett's adventures about a female thief named Zaya. This alone would have left fans duly impressed. Yet even more impressive was that it also featured a slew of well-designed missions, a detailed story told through high-quality cutscenes, and an impeccable level of polish. Shadows of the Metal Age would have likely gone on to become the series' most famous fan-developed project had it not been followed, only a few years later, by The Dark Mod, an open-source stealth game designed to evoke the look and feel of the first two Thief games and encourage the creation of user-generated missions. In addition to being both immensely well-regarded and supported following its initial release in 2009, the Dark Mod would go on to receive a continuous stream of updates and improvements over the next decade, keeping it in the public discourse and in the minds of the franchise faithful for longer than any other creation of its nature. This same period would also see several notable studios bring the immersive sim back to the forefront of the video game industry. Easily the most prominent of this new wave of immersive sims would be 2007's Bioshock, a sub-aquatic shooter developed by Irrational Games under Ken Levine's direction. While technically conceived as a spiritual successor to System Shock 2 and not Thief, Bioshock nonetheless managed to harken back to what had made both series great, with its moody, open-ended environments and highly customizable suite of abilities that could be tailored to suit countless playstyles. Equally well-regarded, but perhaps not quite as famous, would be Dishonored by Arcane Studios, which would see release in 2012. Co-directed by Harvey Smith, Dishonored appeased many a fan of Looking Glass's classics with its gritty Victorian-era setting, steampunk-like technology, and strong emphasis on stealth. One, two, three, Good. Eight. Keep them coming. Uh, today we're going to be playtesting uh, Deus Ex Human Revolution. Um, please just bear in mind. That in the midst of all of this, Eidos would found a new studio in Montreal and promptly put it to work on what would eventually become Deus Ex Human Revolution. The company still wanted to become a major force in the industry and saw Montreal, with its favorable tax and government incentives, as an ideal place for it to further advance this goal. Behind the scenes, however, the only thing that Eidos seemed on track to become was insolvent. Money was being lost on a continuous basis, and most of the games its remaining studios were releasing weren't quite paying the bills. With few other options on the table, the company put itself up for sale, and Square Enix, looking to expand its global operations, scooped it up at the beginning of 2009. Many were taken by surprise by Square's sudden interest in Eidos, noting that its properties seemed an odd match for the former storied catalog of Japanese role-playing games, and their surprise would only be strengthened a few months later when the Montreal studio revealed that it was also working on Thief 4 for both consoles and PC. Exactly what Eidos planned on doing with Thief 4 would remain unknown for a long time after, with the studio keeping quiet on the status of its development for the next several years. Nevertheless, spirits would rise dramatically during this period after the studio would release Deus Ex Human Revolution in 2011. Stylish, polished, and oozing with mechanics and systems ripe for experimentation, Human Revolution left many feeling hopeful that Eidos Montreal would be able to do the Thief series justice and fashion their title into just as strong of an experience. Yet when the studio finally started showing it off to the public in 2013, fans found themselves growing concerned. By this point, the game had morphed into a reboot simply titled Thief. And while it bore no shortage of aesthetic similarities to the series they all knew and loved, its gameplay seemed 
a beat off from what his predecessors had offered. Guards appeared overly easy to avoid. Garrett could enter a focus mode that allowed him to scan his environment at a whim, and the levels he explored held no reservations telegraphing what needed to be done next. It seemed to hold promise, but underneath that promise was a sinking fear that Eidos had strayed too far from what made the franchise's past games great. And this fear was only compounded further by incoming articles that suggested all was not well behind the scenes, with a report published on Polygon in April of 2013 claiming that corporate politics, creative confusion, and a host of other issues had been plaguing Eidos Montreal's game for some time. However, in an interview with Polygon only a few months after the aforementioned report, Eidos Montreal founder Stéphane Dastou would claim that things had been blown out of proportion contending that every AAA game's development has its ups and downs, and that all of these reported troubles were simply from when the project was experiencing its worst nadir. This sentiment would later be echoed by producer Stéphane Waugh, who would claim that while the project did experience a period in which its focus wasn't very clear, he had been able to direct and restore this focus after a bit of work. Whether or not Eidos Montreal's Thief reboot was truly troubled during its development will likely remain up for debate. What isn't up for debate, however, was that their finished project proved underwhelming upon its February 2014 release. Critics and old school fans alike almost unanimously agreed that it did a poor job of evoking its predecessors' feel and depth. Where the original trilogy had provided players with open-ended environments that players could approach with a great degree of freedom, Eidos Montreal's Thief felt largely devoid of the latter, with its levels providing entertaining, yet fairly linear excursions that discouraged going too far off script. Most players, likewise, wouldn't care much for the game's story, finding its writing poor and its lack of references to older Thief lore frustrating, yet not as frustrating as the game's technical issues which dotted the experience with considerable and unfortunate frequency. Eidos Montreal's reboot wasn't outright terrible, but as a follow-up to Human Revolution and a tribute to Looking Glass and Ion Storm's legacy, it was considerably disappointing. When Thief will resurface next as anyone's guess. Even after its fourth title's missteps, the series continues to remain an icon within its genre, as does its world and characters. Eidos Montreal seems to be safe under Square Enix's wings for a long time to come, but with Square having remained mum on the possibility of another entry for some time now, it's unlikely that it will be bringing back Looking Glass's stealth franchise anytime soon. Reports of a fifth game being in development did briefly make headlines in 2017, when a production company tapped to work on a film adaptation of the series claimed on its website that the title was forthcoming and would be released in step with their motion picture. But this claim was quickly refuted by Eidos Montreal head David Enfancy. There also has been no further news about this film adaptation since this debacle, suggesting that it too has likely been put out to pasture. The only thing that's known for certain is that no matter what happens, the Thief community will undoubtedly continue to keep its memory alive and its level editors well used. Likewise, while it remains to be seen what will become of series like Bioshock and Dishonored, one has to imagine that their designers will continue to imbue the values of these series into their future endeavors. Even if pure immersive sims disappear from AAA game development, there will be no shortage of experiences that continue to espouse their style of gameplay and feature richly detailed environments that encourage players to carve their own path through its obstacles. Such is the lasting power of Looking Glass and Ion Storm's games, and the legacy of Thief. Thank you for watching our video. Our documentaries are crowdfunded and made possible by your continued support for us. We'd like to thank by name the generous patrons who have pledged to our highest reward tier. Caleb Shishkifich, Darirap Sigurdsson, emumovies.com, Jefferson Dos Santos Oliveira, Maktoum Said Al Maktoum, Timur Turis Bekov. If you enjoy our content, please consider subscribing to our channel and joining us on Patreon. Thank you.
Forget the gloom if I catch the Foundryman's troop. The perfect shot! Mm, that's me! More jerky. Oh, I hate jerky.